What's up, I'm Vin, and today I wanna to show how to evaluate limits algebraically. So here are the six questions we're gonna go through, and let's get started. So for this first question here, and all the questions we do, the first thing we should try is just evaluating this limit by direct substitution. So notice the limit is as x approaches one. So we could just replace every x with the one, and we'll have one to the third minus seven times one squared plus 12 times one over four minus one. And if we simplify this, we have one minus seven is negative six, plus 12 is six, and then we have six divided by three. So this simplifies to two, and this is our final answer. But another way we could have went through this, which would have taken more time, is to simplify this algebraically. So we could take the limit as x approaches one, and this time around, let's say we factor out an x, and we have x times x squared minus seven x plus 12 over four minus x. And then all I want to do different here is for the next line, we're going to break this quadratic up into two factors. So we have x times x minus 3 times x minus 4. Just remember the shortcut is we have negative 3 plus negative 4 gives us the middle term negative 7. And the product of negative 3 and negative 4 is positive 12. Over, and I'll just take out a negative 1 on bottom. We'll have negative 1 times x minus 4. And you can see the x minus 4 over x minus 4 is going to cancel out. And if we simplify this, now when we plug in x equals 1, we have 1 times 1 minus 3 divided by negative 1, which gives us 1 times negative 2, which is negative 2, over negative 1, which is also positive 2. But I think we could all agree here the first solution is much easier. So the theme is you should always try plugging in first when evaluating limits algebraically. Now for the second example here, we should start exactly the same way by plugging in x equals 3, since this time the limit is as x is approaching 3. But this time around, when we go to just plug in, notice we're going to get the square root of, we have 3 times 3 is 9, plus 16 is 25, minus 5 over 3 minus 3. And the square root of 25 is 5, so we're going to get 0 over 0. And the most common mistake I see with these kind of limits is that when people get 0 over 0, they just automatically say that the limit doesn't exist. But this just means this form is indeterminate, which means we have more work to do. And in this case, we're just going to have to do a bit of algebra. So the algebra that we're going to use here is we're going to multiply the numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the binomial in the numerator. Now that was a lot to say, so just uh, you'll see what I mean in a moment. If I take the term on top and I find the conjugate, which I find by just changing the ending, so we have the square root of 3x plus 16, and instead of minus 5, we just change it to a plus 5. When we multiply the top and bottom by this conjugate, it's actually going to make this limit simplify nice. So we'll just move this out of the way since, once again, we have to do algebra this time because the limit cannot be determined simply by substitution. So the little shortcut here in algebra that we want to make use of is this idea that when we multiply a binomial by its conjugate, the quick way to evaluate it is we just take a squared minus b squared, where a is the first term, and in this case, a is the square root of 3x plus 16. And b is the second term, which in this case is 5. So if we think about it, a squared in this case would just be 3x plus 16. And then b squared would be 25. All right, but this is, once again, depending on how strong your algebra skills are. After you do enough of these questions, you don't have to write all this stuff out. You just know in the next line that when you multiply the stuff in the numerator, you're going to have the first term squared, which is 3x plus 16 minus the second term squared, which is 25. You could, uh, some people call it FOIL or multiplying two binomials, kind of, you know, show the distribution, but the outside and inside products are always going to cancel, leaving you with a squared minus b squared. That's why it's helpful to know this little bit of algebra. And on bottom, don't fall into the trap here of distributing this. That's a little bit of a waste of time. You're just going to leave the bottom in factored form. So we're going to leave it like this. So now, this time around, notice we have 16 minus 25, which is going to simplify to minus 9. So we have 3x minus 9. And in the next line, if we factor that, so we're taking 3x minus 9, we could factor out a 3, and we have 3 times x minus 3. And in the denominator, we have x minus 3. And that big factor here, square root 3x plus 16 with the plus 5. So now, notice the x minus 3s can cancel out. So to simplify this limit, all we have to do now is just substitute in x equals 3. So we have that leftover constant 3. And now we have the square root of, we have 3 times 3 plus 16 
plus 5. That's the only leftover factor, and the x is being replaced with 3. So now we have 3 over, and 9 plus 16 is 25. The square root of 25 is 5. So we're left with 5 plus 5 in the denominator. So our solution to the second example, the limit is 3 tenths. So for this kind of limit, notice there's two variables, but the trick is that you only replace h with 0. So if you're trying to see if this is going to work by substitution in your head, just know you're going to be replacing only h with 0. So you'd have the square root of 5x plus 5 times 0 would be 0, minus the square root of 5x over h is equal to 0. But this gives you square root 5x minus square root 5x, which is going to give you 0 over 0, which is indeterminate, which means we have a bit of algebra to do. Now the algebra this time is going to be very similar to what we did before. We're going to be multiplying the top and bottom by the conjugate. So we have our binomial on top, and we're going to just take the conjugate of this. So we're multiplying by the square root of 5x plus 5h plus square root of 5x. And on bottom, we have h times, and in this fraction, we're going to have the same thing. So we're just rewriting this a second time. So remember, the idea is we want to use that difference of two squares concept. And this time around, notice our first term is square root of 5x plus 5h. So in a way, when we multiply this out, we're just going to be squaring the first term. We're doing square root 5x plus h times itself is just 5x plus 5h minus, and we have square root 5x times square root 5x is 5x. Once again, it's this difference of two squares idea. When we have the product of two conjugates, we could write this as the first term squared minus the second term squared. That's exactly what we did. It saves us a little bit of time. And in the denominator, we have h times the square root of 5x plus 5h plus the square root of 5x. So notice on top, 5x minus 5x cancels out. And now when we rewrite this limit as h goes to 0, we're left with 5h on top. And we're left with h times, and we have the square root of 5x plus 5h plus, and we have this extra square root 5x. But now h over h could simplify. And we could just plug in h equals 0. A common mistake here is people plug in 0 for all the variables, but you're only plugging in 0 for h because it's the limit as h goes to 0. So now you've got 5 over, and you've got square root 5x plus 5 times 0. See, this is the term we're replacing with 0. We have 5 times h, which 5 times 0 becomes 0, and then plus square root 5x. So now, just to simplify our final answer here, we have 5 over, and we've got square root 5x plus square root 5x, which is going to give us 2 square root 5x. In your other classes before calculus, your teacher might have made a point for you to rationalize the denominator, but it's totally fine for you to write your answer like this. So this is our solution to the third question. So for this fourth question, we could start the exact same way, and we're going to try to evaluate this limit directly by substituting. So when we plug in one-third, on top we're going to have one-third minus a third, which is zero. And on bottom, if we do three times one-third, that's going to give us one. We have one minus one squared. So we have 0 over 0 again, which means that our limit right now is indeterminate, which means we have more work to do. So the way we're going to evaluate this limit is I want to expand out the bottom. And notice here we have x minus a third. And the bottom, we're going to have 3x minus 1 times 3x minus 1. And one extra thing that I want to do here, we have the limit as x approaches a third. And the top, we're going to leave alone for now. But on bottom, I'm going to factor a 3 out of one of the factors. Let's just say I'm factoring 3 out of the first factor. I would be left with, once I take the 3 out, I'll have x minus a third left. And then the second factor, I'll just leave as 3x minus 1. And one thing that's obvious now is that this factor, x minus a third, could cancel on top and bottom. So now I'm just going to write the leftovers. We have the limit as x approaches a third. And we're left with just 1 on top. And we have 3 times. 3x minus 1. So now, one thing that arises out of this is now if we plug in a third, we're going to have 1 over 0, which right now is kind of hinting that the limit is not going to exist. But to show you that 100% sure that the limit does not exist, I want to investigate the limit on the right side of 1 third and on the left side of 1 third and show that you're going to get two different things. So we got 1 over 3 times 3x minus 1. And for this type of limit, it's all number sense. 
So what you have to think about to evaluate this limit, let's assume we're doing this without technology. Because if we had technology, of course, we could just look at this and see there's a vertical asymptote, and the graph is going up to infinity and down to negative infinity on either side of the asymptote. But for this part here, let's say I'm plugging in a number slightly bigger than a third. Well, I'm going to have 1 over 3 times, and we have 3 times a third. And I'm going to put a plus here to show that we're plugging a number slightly bigger than a third, minus 1. So when you think about this very carefully, 3 times a third is 1. But if I plug in a number a little bit bigger than a third, I'm going to have a number a little bit bigger than 1. And if I do a number a little bit bigger than 1 minus 1, I'm going to have a number a little bit bigger than 0, which I'm going to indicate with this 1 over 0 plus. And now this is where your number sense comes in. I want you to think about what happens as you do 1 divided by 0 0.000, and you add a whole bunch of zeros and then a 1. This is heading towards infinity. So that's why this limit here heads towards positive infinity. So the limit on the right side is heading to infinity. But now let's investigate what is the limit as x approaches 1 third on the left side. So I'm going to rewrite the same leftover expression. We have 1 over 3 times 3x minus 1. But now when we think about this part of the question here, so you need more room to think. Now we're going to have 1 over 3, and then in parentheses we have 3 times 1 third, but now a number is slightly less than a third minus 1. And this time around, when 3 over 3 cancels, we'll, we're, we are going to be left with a number a little bit less than 1. So when you do a number a little bit less than 1 minus 1, you're going to have a very, very tiny, tiny negative number. Okay, so it's going to be 1 over 0 minus, or a tiny number with a negative in front. So we're going to have 1 over 0 minus here. So now when you think about this, if I were to do 1 divided by negative point zero 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 and just a whole bunch of zeros and a one this is heading towards negative infinity so that tells me my limit on the left side is heading towards negative infinity but from limits what we know is that anytime you have the right side limit and the left side limit not heading to the same place that means that the limit in general does not exist so this limit we could say does not exist so for question 5, we're going to start the same way as we did the other questions. We're going to plug in this time x equals 81. And when we plug in x equals 81, the fourth root of 81 is 3. Minus 3 we have, and then we have 81 minus 81, which once again is going to give us 0 over 0, which tells us we cannot evaluate this limit by direct substitution. So now we're going to switch to algebra. And the algebra I want to go with here is I want to treat this as a difference of two squares question. So this is a pretty nice trick that you could use. Remember the idea that anytime you have a squared minus b squared, you could factor this when you take the square root of the first term, which is a, plus the square root of the second term, and multiply by the square root of the first term minus the square root of the second term. So now, when we apply that concept here, I want to apply that concept to x minus 81. So I know this doesn't say x squared, but just know the idea is that I take the square root of x plus the square root of 81, which is 9, and multiply by the square root of the first term, x, minus the square root of the second term, the square root of 81 is still 9. So now I want to apply this difference of two squares concept once more. But the extra detail that I need here is what happens when I take the square root of the square root of x? Well, if I do the square root of the square root of x, that's the same thing as x to the 1 half raised to the 1 half again. And when we evaluate this kind of expression, we just multiply exponents, and we get x to the 1 fourth, which is the same thing as the fourth root of x. So you can see this fourth root of x term in the numerator. This is how we're going get to get that term to cancel. So now we apply this idea. I'll just put a dividing line here. So we have x minus 81 is equal to, so we've got x minus 81. And the first thing we're just going to leave alone, we have the square root of x plus 9. That factor we're not going to touch. But the second factor is going to break down into two pieces. So we have the square root of the first term, which once again, the square root of the square root of x is equal to the fourth root of x. So we have the fourth root of x, and then plus the square root of 9. The square root of 9 is 3. And we've got the fourth root of x, because once again, we're doing the square root of the first term, this time minus the square root of the second term. And we're going to write a 3 here. So this is a way for us to break down x minus 81. 
So now we use that for this limit. So we'll write this substitution over here. We have the limit as x approaches 81. And on top, we're going to leave that factor alone. We have the fourth root of x minus 3. And on bottom, x minus 81, we're going to write as the square root of x plus 9. And then we've got the fourth root of x plus 3 times the fourth root of x minus 3. And since the fourth root of x minus 3 is going to cancel, I'm just going to write an extra 1 out here. So we can see that we just have a factor of 1 left over. So now once the term cancels out here, now we could try plugging in x equals 81. And this time around, we'll have much better luck. So let's see, we have 1 over, and now we have the first factor. We're going to have square root of 81 plus 9. And now the second factor, we have the fourth root of 81 plus 3. So when we simplify this, this is going to be 1 over, and we have 9 plus 9 is 18. And the second factor, the fourth root of 81 is 3. 3 plus 3 is 6. So if you want to simplify this in your head, I just use distribution here. So we have 18 times 6. I'm just doing 6 times 10 plus 8, which gives you 60 plus 48, which gives you 108. So this is going to be 1 over 108. That's our limit to the fifth example. Now, for the last example here, this looks complicated, but that's why you should absolutely try plugging in first because a common mistake here is people are just going to jump right into this and start conjugating and turning this into something much crazier than it is. All you have to do here is plug in. We have 1 over, and we have sine of pi over 2 minus 1 over, and now in the denominator we have pi over 2 plus pi over 2. So this we could evaluate by direct substitution. And notice what we get here. We have 1 over sine of pi over 2 is 1. So we're going to have 1 divided by 1 is 1 minus 1 over pi over 2 plus pi over 2 is pi, which gives you 0 over pi. But this is perfectly fine. 0 over pi is just 0. And that's our solution to the last question. OK, well, this is going to conclude this video on evaluating limits algebraically. If you found this video to be helpful, please like and subscribe. It really helps me grow the channel. And if you've got any requests, just leave the topics you want me to cover in the comment section below. And thank you for watching.